Hello, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the CEO of Weaving Influence, and I'm so thrilled today to spend some time with a few authors that my team and I supported this year as we look at leadership insights and highlights from 2019. So today I have three three authors with me, right? Um, four, actually. Um, I have Mark Brown. He's the author of Outward Bound Lessons to Live a Life of Leadership. And many of you may have been a part of our webinar earlier this year where we focused in on Mark's tremendously good book. Um, I also have today with me Susan Fowler, who's been a, an author I've worked with for many years. And this year she had a new book, Master Your Motivation, and maybe you were on our earlier webinar this year as well, talking to Susan. Uh, finally, I have today with me for the first time ever on a webinar with me, Tamara Chandler and Laura Graylish of People Firm based in Seattle and their new book this year, Feedback and Other Dirty Words. So as you're coming online today, I hope you'll take a moment to find the chat. The chat is a great place for you to engage with one another and also with us throughout the event. And what I would invite you to do is please use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees and let us know where you're calling in from today. So if you could take a quick moment and say hello, remember to use the drop down that says all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. And uh, we'd love to know why you decided to join us today. So welcome Rob in Delaware and Daryl in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, welcome in California. So in case you're curious geographically where we're represented on this call today, um, I am in my home office in Lambertville, Michigan. And Susan, tell us where you are. I'm in Sunday, but Sunday, sunny, but cold San Diego. Uh, and Mark, tell us where you are today. I am in the town of Waimea on the big island in Hawaii. And Laura and Tamara, where are you calling from today? I think I might have already said it. Uh, I'm in Seattle. And I'm just outside of Seattle, outside of Gig Harbor, Washington. Wonderful. So all of you West Coasters, it's in the morning there, it's in the afternoon here. Um, and welcome to those of you who are calling in. It looks like we have New York and Arizona and Denmark and Denmark. Alabama and Ohio and hi, Marsha Reynolds in Phoenix. It's great to see you. Uh, Toronto, Atlanta. So a lot of friends on today's call. Um, so to let you know what today will be like, uh, we are going to talk about three uh, provocative statements, one from each of these three new books this year, and we're going to have some polls and interactivity. We would invite you throughout the call to type any questions or comments in the moment uh, while they're relevant to the book that we're focused on. And then toward the end, if time allows, we will open up for some additional questions and, you know, we might even surprise you and bring you on camera to talk with, with the authors today. Who knows? This happens to be the last Weaving Influence webinar of 2019. So we're thrilled that you're here. We are recording today and we will be getting back out to you with a link to the recording along with some other follow-up resources and we hope that you'll choose to share them with your colleagues and friends. So that said, why don't we all dive in? Susan, are you ready? I'm ready, Becky. I have a right. provocative statement. I cannot wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my provocative statement is that we've really been living in the dark ages when it comes to motivation, but there's a whole new scientific approach to motivation that um, reveals how you can actually experience a motivation breakthrough anytime, anywhere you choose. Well, I think that probably all of us on this call would love to experience that motivation breakthrough. So let's take a look at today's poll and see what we can learn from this. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and we would invite you to answer it. Now, in the event that you as an attendee cannot see the poll, we would invite you to go ahead and type your response in chat. Um, just a note for you panelists, you will not be able to answer the poll. Um, but here are the answers that we have today. Uh, so we've been living in the dark age of ages of motivation, but a new science-based approach to motivation reveals how you can experience this anytime or anywhere. And our choices are great. I'm open to new possibilities. Tell me how. Maybe, but it still takes carrots and sticks to motivate most of us. Or I disagree. True motivation takes time. Good habits don't happen overnight. So we'll give you a few moments to answer that. I have to say, I succumbed myself this morning to the stick and carrot method of motivation. I stopped on the way to work to buy a coffee to motivate myself to get some important writing done. And guess what? You spilled I'm it. Motivated. No, I didn't do it. 
You, you didn't do the coffee or you didn't do the... Oh, I didn't do the writing. I got Maybe the coffee. It was, it was decaf, delicious. <laughs> Maybe they slipped oh. the decaf, see? <laughs> well, Becky, I honestly think that's a, a, a really good point. And so as soon as we see the poll results, you know, we can analyze your experience. All righty. I'm going to end this polling and we can take a look at the results. Um, it looks like 91% of the people who answered our poll are open to new possibilities and waiting for us to tell them how they can experience a motivation breakthrough. You know, um, I guess I should have expected that given that they're on a webinar to learn, um, but I'm just really stunned. And one of the things that I've really learned over the past year, um, actually since 2014 when my first book on motivation came out, is that these ideas are so deeply embedded in our psyche, these old, um, these old ideas about motivation, that it's really hard for people to let go and, and to understand that habits can actually literally change in a moment. We don't really need um, to, to absolutely do things over time. Uh, it's not that that doesn't work. It's just, not, it's just that that's not the only way that you can either develop a good ha habit or stop a bad habit. Um, and that, um, that, like you experienced this morning, um, if you're having to bribe yourself to write by getting a cup of coffee, um, then that's a real indicator. That's a, one of those kind of mindful moments to be asking, wow, why am I needing that cup of coffee in order to write? Because there's three psychological needs that if they're not satisfied or you're not creating them in your life, you are not going to be um, able to generate the kind of positive energy required to do what it is you say you want to do. So if you want to write, you're trying to develop a habit to write every morning, and you're having to bribe yourself, you need to ask yourself, okay, why am I making choices to not write? Why am I choosing to do something other than writing? Is it because I have different priorities? Maybe I need to really think about my priorities. Is it because I have different values? And that gets to the second psychological need, the first one being choice, the second one being connection, that you might not have a connection to writing or whatever your habit or goal is that is values-based. Um, maybe you haven't really even really developed your values and then thought about how those values are aligned to what it is you're trying to do or not do. So we need to have choice. We need to have that perception that what we're doing is our choice, not that we have to do it. We don't feel imposed. Uh, we need to have some kind of connection, either interpersonally or to values or a deeper sense of purpose or to inner joy, which is different than excitement. Because excitement is like a momentary happening that could be based on something that's not even healthy. And then the third thing we need to have is a sense of competence. And so if when you write, you don't appreciate what you write, or you don't feel like you're growing and learning from your writing, if you're not seeing progress with the quality of your writing or the development of your thoughts, that could be eroding your motivation to write every morning. And so it's, it's really a matter, if you wanna have a motivation breakthrough, of learning motivation as a skill. And what that means is learning to ask yourself, what choices am I making? What other choices could I be making? And um, do I have a choice? And if so, what are they? And then how do I create connection? How do I bring meaning into what I'm trying to do? Um, how do I align with values or a deeper sense of purpose or to people that I care about or making a contribution to the greater good or the welfare of the whole? And thirdly, how do I create competence? How do I actually notice and, and, um, and give myself the time and the, the ability to gain competence? You know, how do I um, train myself or get trained or, or build my skills? But mainly, how do I, how do I just um, learn to master something? I don't have to master it. I can master it over time, but every day I need to feel that I'm making progress. So those are the three psychological needs that we need to create in order to have a motivation breakthrough. Well, so maybe we should take a look, Susan, at these outdated ideas that many of us believe about motivation. We have another poll. And then we want to hear from Mark and Laura and Tamara uh, about how these ideas are landing from with them. Okay. Um, so here we go. Another poll. Which of these statements is false? And you can select more than one if you would like. Uh, when it comes to motivation, more is better. Uh, most techniques for motivating people today are based on B.F. Skinner's animal research. 
You get more bang for your buck when you combine both extrinsic and intrinsic forms of motivation. And the last one is Maslow's hierarchy of needs is empirically proven to be true. So we would love to hear from you about which of these statements uh, seems to be false. false. And we'll give you a few moments. Mm -hmm. We don't get to vote, Susan, so I can't, like, I'm clicking away here thinking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wanted to vote. <laughs> All right. You can give your vote verbally in just a second, Laura. <laughs> okay. No, don't test me. I, I was going to say, <laughs> depends on your motivation, right? All right, just a few more seconds to respond to this. And again, uh, a reminder that we would welcome your comments, questions, feedback in the chat at any time, and I'll be able to bring those ideas into this conversation. You know, right. Susan, when you were talking, I was thinking um, one of the things that Laura and I write about in the feedback book is the idea of progress, not punishment. Yes. And I think it very much connects to what you were just saying about recognizing your own progress. Mm. Totally, and let's talk more about that after we um, get the poll um, results because you're absolutely right. Um, from a leadership point of view, it's really important. And then from an individual point of view, we need to understand that phenomenon too. Yeah. Okay, so, so these are false. Yes, so it looks like um, the one that most people think is false is when it comes to motivation, more is better. Uh, but we had still a third of the people who think the B.F. Skinner animal research idea is false. 24% um, with the bang for your buck when you combine extrinsic and intrinsic. And then about a third of people think uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is empirically proven to be true is false <laughs> so so yay for our listeners or our watchers or participants because all of those statements are indeed false oh. yeah um and this is what i'm talking about with um our ideas about motivation being so embedded in our psyche that it's actually hard to accept or be open to a, a really radically different approach to motivation so this whole idea about motivation, um, the more you have, the better. That's been one of the biggest myths about motivation over the past 100 years, um, is that motivation is all about the quantity of motivation that you have, when in fact, what we know through the compelling science of motivation, especially self-determination theory, is that it's the quality of your motivation. And the quality of your motivation is determined by whether or not you're creating choice, connection, and competence in your life or around a particular goal or habit. So more is not better if it's the kind of motivation that is external, like I'll reward myself with a cup of coffee or a bonus or a raise or status or power, or fear or threats or disinterest. And so um, more is not better. And then secondly, and I'll go through these quickly because I know we have three other people that need to talk. But um, a, a lot of the techniques for motivating people in the workplace are the carrots and sticks that came out of B.F. Skinner's work on pigeons. And we realized back in the 40s, well, not we, because I wasn't around then, um, but uh, people thought, wow, if we can get pigeons to do whatever we want them to do by giving them a pellet, then that probably will work with people too. And the sad thing is, is that we think it works. Um, that we just give people stuff, we give them perks and bonuses and incentives or bribes, and they'll do what we want them to do. And the sad thing is, is that it actually did work. But it depends on how you define work. Um, we actually lost a lot in the process. We lost creativity and innovation and mental and physical health and sense of well-being. And what we finally understand is that people are not pigeons and that we're motivated by things that are more profound and deeply resonant than um, the, the pellets. I call it the pecking pigeon paradigm. And we're still stuck in it when it comes to organizations. And then um, the third um, alternative was you get more bang for your buck if you add both extrinsic and intrinsic. And this is my um, argument with books or people that have interpreted the motivation science and boiled it down too simplicitly. Simplicitly? Simplistically. Thank you. That's it. 
um, to intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Because um, the fact is that um, extrinsic motivation erodes intrinsic motivation. So if you're intrinsically motivated, adding extrinsic will undermine the intrinsic. And so what we really need to understand is that there's actually six different ways of being motivated and that when you learn motivation is a skill, you can then really control the type of motivation you have and choose the kind of motivation you have. And then finally, um, Maslow's hierarchy, most popular motivation theory in the world. Maslow didn't even come up with that triangle. An advertising guy did. And Maslow's contribution was helping us realize that motivation shouldn't be made uh, based on drive, on drive theory, on, on like the biological drives. Instead, he was purporting that we really need to look at psychological needs. I think Ma Abraham Maslow would be thrilled with where the science has come, but I think he'd be very dismayed that people are still buck, uh, um, hooked on his stuff from back in the 40s. Susan, can I make a, just a quick? Please. Um, real life example of what you're talking about. So I, I in my past life, was um, on the leadership team. I, uh, I joined an auto dealer group with no background in the auto business, and I was brought in to change the culture. And one of the first things we did um, first was clarify the mission, vision, and values of the company, and that was a very organic process. It came from the people who had been there a long time. Um, it was a company that had managers who had been with the company 30, 40 years. So we really uncovered what did it mean to be a part of this company? And then we started aligning our systems with the mission, vision, and values. And one of the first things we did um, and the sales floors is we eliminated commissioned um, salespeople. We took that away. We went to um, paying people a fair living salary. And, um, and then we, we focused on them building relationships with people who wanted to come and buy cars. And the results were um, in the, typical in, in the sales departments in the car industry, it's typical to have 60 to 70% turnover in a year. That's considered normal in the car business. And the only people who stay are the people who are hardcore enough to kind of go through all of the pain. You know, as a consumer, I never once thought about car salesperson when I went to buy a car. You know, I geared myself up to do battle. I didn't think of a human being. Um, I was fortunate that the company I joined was thinking about, you know, the family that owned the company thought about their own employees and said, That's you know, great. this is unhealthy for these folks. So we, we changed the system around. We created a very mission-driven company that was all about serving with integrity, kindness, and respect. We, we literally turned over our staff because most of the old guard that liked that kind of business decided to leave. But what, what came in, um, in place was people who were very servant oriented and our turnover dropped down to 10%. Our volume of sales went up. All the, all the business metrics got better. And what we did is we simply eliminated the, the carrot, if you will. And we also, we put people on a 40 hour work week. We took them away from that 80 hour work week that they normally wow. work. We, we made it a human centered place. And all, all of the things you're saying rang true for us for sure. People continue, yeah. they, they, had a, they had a career path to grow and develop themselves. All the things that you're, yeah. you're alluding to were all part do, of do that you know, change. You know what, Mark? What's frustrating sometimes for me is when I talk to, especially sales organizations, and I ask them, why are you offering an incentive to your salespeople? Do you feel like your product needs you know, an incentive to sell? Do you feel like they don't care about your product? Do you feel um, like they're afraid that your clients or customers won't want the product? And almost inevitably, the answer I get is, I don't know. It's just what we've always done. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's, I think that incentives are the lazy man's way of trying to go to market. And, and so, yeah, this it's takes also, a little bit more time and thought. Also the lazy person's way to manage and lead because yes. you know, that's what they used to say, the pay plan's the manager. If people don't work hard, they won't get paid. And but that led to 70% turnover and really yeah, unhealthy exactly. work habits. So right. I, I think you're yeah. right on. You know, it's interesting because Laura and I do uh, a lot of work in the space of rebooting performance management and trying to help organizations mm. bring their, their enterprises into the modern era. And Susan, I, you know, when you said old practices, if there is any place where old ideas and a lot of bad ideas still run rampant, it's in the world of performance management. And when we look at it, we say there's three common goals of performance management. 
management, you're trying to drive organizational performance, you're trying to uh, grow people and develop people, and you're trying to reward equitably. And when anyone tries to fix performance management and not address the reward equity, equitably mm. piece, it fails. Um, and so we've done, particularly in this last couple of years, a lot of writing about getting real with rewards because that's been the hardest place to bust people up. Like people, it's not hard to say, oh, okay, I can go to quarterly check-ins. I can do these things that include you know, frequency of feedback and that type of thing, sort of. We'll talk more about that. But um, what, when you start to say, hey, you really have to let go of these old ideas of how we recognize and reward people and start to get really clear with, what matters and how you as make that as transparent and equitable as possible. It really is hard to move people out of, you know, old thinking. Tamara, there is so much in what you just said. And can I maybe just build on a couple of things and, I, and then I'm gonna loop back to what your statement was about feedback as well from earlier. Um, so first of all, when we say that people are money motivated, yes, people are motivated by money, but one of the articles that I would like to send to people if they're interested, and if, and, if, and we're gonna put in the chat or somewhere, um, uh, if you will text the word articles, plural, articles, to 66866, um, you will receive some articles based on um, their journal articles that I've published recently, um, and the, one of the articles is about money in the workplace. And one of the things that's really clear is that it's the reason that people want money that's important, not the fact that they want money. And when people complain about money or rewards in the workplace, it's not because they're necessarily externally motivated. It's because it's a justice issue. It's like you said, it's about equity or um, being equitable. And so distributive and procedural justice is at the heart of most people's complaints and they don't even understand that for themselves. Title. And then, okay. and yeah. And one of the reasons that people actually, you know, we always hear the reason people leave organizations is because of a bad manager. It's not really true. The reason people leave organizations is a lack of justice or it's injustice. And if you have a bad manager, the fact that that organization is endorsing or allowing that bad manager to stay in place feels unjust. So um, anyway, so I just really appreciate that you're, you're dealing with, I love that, get real with rewards. I think that's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one just, of the things okay. we do when, you know, what you're really getting at is at, at the heart of, what, of the feedback book, which is trust. And when we, um, when we do our work in the performance management space, we always start by collecting perspectives from the organization, hopefully as many people as they'll allow to weigh in, into what the future design principles are, what the attributes are that we want of a future solution. And Lauren, I've been watching that data for years now, and we've got 19 what we call canned design principles, ones that we wrote that people select from. And of those 19, we see all of them pop up in different places, but the one that is always at the top, almost always at the top, is trust and transparency. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the more that we can build trust and transparency into organizations, the more that we can truly change them for the better. But when you even talk about these old ideas that we need to let go of, most of those old ideas are because we don't trust our people and we aren't willing to be transparent in the way we want to lead and drive. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's at the root of it, it, it comes back to that. And until we can say, well, you know, as you were saying, Mark, I'm going to put the human back in the center and I'm going to trust that human to show up and to do their best work. And that if I lean into that, I can help them reach their potential. Um, you know, that's how we transform organizations. Well, and just to bring it back to, to motivation, just to show how interrelated what three of four of us are, are actually doing, trust is a byproduct of experiencing choice, connection, and competence. So the research between psychological needs being satisfied and trust being generated is, is extraordinary. So, yay, um, it all... It all comes and, 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 and integrates. So I guess um, just to transition, um, yes. because I probably need to transition from my topic, but let me just say that my, my 
advice to anyone if you really want to master your motivation, if you want to build trust between you and the people that you lead or between you and the person who leads you, um, we've got to create choice, connection, and competence. And my first book, Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does, was designed for leaders like how, and managers and parents and teachers uh, and coaches. And how do you help people to um, experience those psychological needs? But then Master Your Motivation, the book that came out uh, this year, is really for the individual. How do you take the science of motivation and how do you create choice, connection, and competence for yourself? Thank you, Susan. And I do have some notes from folks who are looking for resources. Unfortunately, the join by text only works in the US. However, when we send out a follow-up email, we'll make arrangements for those of you who are around the world to get Absolutely. all of today's resources. Absolutely. So switching gears and moving to this topic of motivation, we actually have two provocative statements. And I'm not sure, Laura or Tamara, who's going to do the first one. And we do have a poll that goes with Both. us. Oh, we go together. Just hit us. All right, let's go. <laughs> I'm not sure which one is up first. Yeah, are they in the order? order? Uh, uh, the seeker of feedback is the first okay. one. Okay. Laura, why don't you talk about okay. that? I'm yakking on. And again, I think it's going to blend very, very nicely with what we're hearing from Susan. So our first provocative statement that we'd like to speak about is this um, assumption that we propose that being the seeker of feedback is the most important role any of us can play, regardless of whether you're the employee or the manager. So being the seeker of feedback is the most important role that any of us can play. No way, I'm the leader and I'm the giver of the feedback. Sell me on the idea, I'm not quite sure, or I agree wholeheartedly, we should be seekers. And we'll give you a few moments to answer that poll that's in process. Again, if you aren't able to see the poll for some reason, you can feel free to put your comments in the chat and we'll read those out as well. So we'll give you a few more seconds. Being a seeker of feedback is the most important yeah. role that any of us can play. You know, Susan, when we um, kind of going back again to the old ideas, when, when Laura and I first decided we were going to write this book, a lot of it was because as we were out doing the work in the performance space, what we were real, realizing is that there were, there was one huge hurdle that we needed to move past and that was getting people to create what we define and we have our own very clear view of a true culture of feedback. And that as you start to dig into it, there was so many, um, bad ideas, so much of <laughs> feedback that had gone wrong, right? We say feedback has a really horrible reputation, a bad brand, and we need to fix it. So our whole mo motivation is trying to create a whole movement to fix feedback. And what we are very clear on is the way that we fix feedback is for all of us to accept this role as seeker. That if we turn the tables and we start to seek the 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 feedback we need for the growth we want, so speaking of your motivation, um, that's how we can start to change the whole dialogue and the whole perspective we all have around feedback. Yeah. That's beautiful. And this role, the, you know, we started with, oh gosh, there's this role of the giver and the receiver, the giver and the receiver, and we realized there was really this shadow role, right? The shadow role of seeker. Let's see what people are saying. Um, nobody said, no way, I'm the leader and should be giving the feedback. Thank you. But <laughs> many of you are not out there when we're, when we're talking all over the world about this. Managers really, really still are, are sure that they have the right answer and they should be giving the feedback. Sell me on the idea. Some people want to talk about it. And then thank you for those who agree wholeheartedly that we should be leading the way and one of the things we, we do again all over the world is say, are you, you know, think about this mm. right now in the last, if you're a leader uh, and even if you're uh, a team member, ask yourself in the last week or month, have I sought proactively sought feedback about myself, my behaviors, my work group? Have you, it's a great idea. But have you and how many times? You know, increasing that seeking behavior is one of the things we think can really change the culture of feedback and why people say why. Um, uh, Susan, you talk about connection and trust and we know that um, being a seeker 
first of all, puts you at choice. I can choose uh, what it is that I'm working on. I can choose who, who I trust to give me feedback. But also as a leader, it really creates this uh, phenomenon of psychological safety. If people around us see us in a bit of a vulnerable state saying, I don't know it all. I'm a learn it all, right? I do have a growth mindset. I care about your opinion. Those of you who work with me or for me, I care about your opinion. I care enough to ask you and you and you how this work is going. I care enough about all of you to ask, how am I leading you? How am I showing up for you? Love so that. creating that psychological safety net first as leaders, then it kind of takes the you know, it takes that trust level up and that scarcity level down for employees to go, hey, I can, I can ask for feedback. It's not going to hurt. You know, um, in the um, science, the motivation science, there's two people, a woman named Marilyn Gagney and another named Sharon Parker, and they have merged their extraordinary research in motivation and proactive behavior. And what they found is that the more proactive behavior you engage in, the more optimally motivated you'll be, the more you're going to experience choice, connection, and competence. And there, um, and I wrote about this in my book as well, I call it flipping the feedback. And that when you flip the feedback and you ask, rather than waiting to receive it, you are more likely to um, experience choice, connection, and competence. But the other thing is that Sharon Parker says, uh, you will also um, be energized. You will literally feel less stress yes. at the end of the day. That yes. it, it literally affects your sense of well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. We know that psychologically, uh, feedback, traditional feedback. And, and Tamara and I pose a new definition of feedback. You know, we, okay. we pondered the, do we call it critical feedback? Do we call it appreciative feedback? Do we call it bad, good? And we just said, you know what, we're going to flatten the definition and feedback is feedback. If <laughs> the only purpose is to help someone grow or a team grow or a relationship grow, thrive or move forward. It, it's not good, bad. It doesn't have an assessment. It's feedback. And if we it's can pure. Switch, it's pure. It's pure. And if we can switch our mindsets to seek and give that kind of feedback, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's, you know, the old mindset is that it was bad or it's critical or it's constructive. It's just moving you forward, helping you grow and thrive. But um, one thing we know, Laura, I was just going to jump in. The one thing that we know is that when you say feedback, there's what we call this phantom word that floats in front of it. It's the negative, right? Everyone assumes that feedback is negative. And it's interesting because the research shows, and this is particularly for any of your leaders out there, that you would have far more higher results from your team if all you gave them was positive feedback. Now, everyone will say, I want both. I want uh, you know, as we said, sort of development oriented feedback, critical feedback. But the truth is, as humans, we actually thrive most on the recognition and positive feedback. Now, I'm not just saying blow up my skirt. I'm saying specific, actionable feedback that, you know, I can, I can take in. And I think particularly when you tie back to your idea of progress and motivation, as seekers, it is okay to seek the positive feedback. It is okay to say, help me understand what progress I am making. Because sometimes we need someone else to say, hey, girlfriend, look at what you've done. Like, what do you mean? Right? So you, it's okay to seek. And we should more often than not look at that. Like, what, where am I having the greatest impact? What can I do? Uh, where can I lean more into my strengths to help this team? Like, the more that we do that, the more we understand our strengths, which we, any of us who are been following that research know that that's where the power is, is in leaning into our strengths. So the more that we can seek that positive feedback as well and be willing to accept it, you know, we say savor it, take it in, roll it around like that lollipop in your mouth for a good long time and, and really let it soak in and understand what it means and how you can take that forward. And it, so when we talk about feedback, we don't mean just running around going, hey, what am I doing wrong? Like, how, how am I an idiot? What should I do better? That's just not 
going to help us? And frankly, when you ask people those questions, talk about fear, their fear goes way up because they're like, oh my gosh, I have, what are you looking for? Right. Yeah. But if you say to someone, yeah. you know, I'm really can, not can I ask you, it. can I ask you a question Tamara? Yeah. regarding that? Because this is something I've done a lot of writing about because, um, and I get a lot of pushback on it. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you and Laura think. And, and Mark, I know you know a lot about um, motivation theory as well. Right. That, that when you praise people as a leader or if an individual, you're seeking praise, um, that that becomes a form of external motivation that actually um, then can erode deeper and more meaningful reasons that you would um, take information in and, and move forward. Yeah. And what I mean by praise is that it's somebody else's personal opinion about you. So when we, so if our, our, if you're a leader and you say, Oh, Becky, I'm so proud of the way you put this together. And I just think you're, you're just so delightful and you're so wonderful. That feels really good for Becky in the moment. But then if I don't say that, or I say that to someone else and not to Becky, then she feels like, oh, wow, what, why didn't I get that praise? Right, right. But, if, but if we're specific, or if Becky was to say to me, Susan, um, let's talk about our approach to this webinar, this webcast. What do you think I should do again in the future? And what, would you, what changes would you recommend? Then that's a very different conversation. Yeah. Uh, so how do you feel about that? Susan, I'll take this one, Tamara. In, in the workshops that we're running all over the world, we actually do an exercise that says, um, using the model that we call connect. So there's another great uh, connection <laughs> with your work that in order to turn praise or appreciation or recognition, that kind of shiny feel good, but sometimes di disingenuous thing into true feedback, feedback that helps me grow, learn or thrive. There's pieces that you can pull out of it. And most importantly, you need to, keep it very specific and share the effect uh, with others. And so for example, it might be, wow, here's, here's praise. Wow, you guys, that webinar, it was awesome. I just loved it. That, that's about me. I cared about it and I loved exactly. it. That's okay. I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? But if, if we can be more skillful and turn appreciation or praise into true feedback, you know, Tamara, the statement that you said in the webinar got me thinking differently about motivation. And that really stuck with me. I appreciated that. That gives Tamara a piece of feedback that she can use. It might motivate her to, oh, use that same statement again and again. So we really do. I mean, Heck yes, appreciate the heck out of people. But like Tamara said, blowing up your skirt, people know that. That's disingenuous. You know what? That's a really great point. There's a difference between expressing gratitude mm -hmm. and praising people. And exactly. I don't think that we understand the difference yeah. and we don't know when we're recip a recipient of it. We don't have the skill right. to, to, to right. delve into that. You're absolutely yeah, one, right. One of our cute little pictures, we have a lot of pictures in the book. One of the cute little pictures is a, just a sort of simple diagram that talks about recognition, which is a much big, bigger circle and positive feedback, which is a much smaller circle within recognition. And so until, as Laura said, it's specific and something that I can take action on, it's not really feedback. Um, I'm also I'm watching the chat. Oh, there it is. It Look at because, because Tamara's lovely daughter, Ivy, hi, Ivy, did all the <laughs> sketch arts for us. Shameless <laughs> look for the children in our lives. My son did the technical one. And so Ivy drew that. Yeah. So I'm watching the chat and there was some questions around uh, about do, do we teach others to deliver feedback uh, in a way that isn't harmful or hurtful? And absolutely. And one of the things that we would love to share with you and, and uh, Kelly, if you can put our um, text, uh, text by number thing, whatever that is, join by text thing, um, <laughs> we'll send you what we call the um, fan 10, the fine art of noticing. And so mm -hmm. what we really lean into is the idea that the way you do, you remove bias, the way you provide insights that's helpful is to simply share what you've noticed, what you've been a witness of, and not to add judgment or, um, you know, uh, perspective to that, that you can't 
you don't know is true, that may be just your own, your own idea. So the more that we can share what we're noticing, what we're witnessing, and allow people to take that in and think about it, and to then to really discuss it with them, um, a big piece of our connect model is the conversation and the conversation brings trust. And so we think feedback is always a conversation, but it starts with sharing what we've noticed, uh, recognizing the effect, as Laura said, and then bringing that into a conversation to build trust between the two of us uh, or the group of us or whoever's having this feedback conversation. I, yeah. I wanted, I, I love what you're saying too. And I, want, I wanted to add a piece from also watching the feedback. And there's a lot of people asking questions about, well, how do you get people to trust giving feedback up the chain? Oh, there, I think there's, you know, there's a, a lot of stuff that you sparked in your dialogue because I think you know, your, your, the topic of your book is such an um, intense thing for a lot of people because feedback so often in organizations was used as a judgment, as a promotional tool versus a way to help humans grow. To Susan's point, you have to be developing. And in my world, we, you know, we talk about developing that level of mastery. So having a pathway toward mastery is critically important for, for people and if a, any leader or manager can be trained to understand that versus the kind of catching someone doing right or wrong, then it's a very different dialogue. And we, we really try to emphasize the fact that every person is unique and different. So if, we're gonna, if I'm going to be effective as a leader, I need to understand who I'm talking to. So um, everyone on this, you know, the panelists I'm looking at, if, if we were sitting together, I'm sure that each of you has a different history different experience in the world. So if I don't understand that, if I just assume I'm going to tell everyone the same way, the same information, then I'm not going to be effective. I need to understand you as a person. And, you know, I think, again, I think there's so much synergy in, in all of our books, just about really the human in the middle is the important yeah. piece here. If that's, if I'm doing that as a manager, a leader, then there's less issue about you know, how do we navigate it? You know, I, I, need to, I need to model that. I need to be vulnerable and honest. I need to admit when I make mistakes, all these things. If I do that as a leader, I'm going to create that atmosphere. Where Absolutely. And demonstrate care. You know, again, in our workshops all over the world, we start, Mark, with our own feedback selves and our own feedback story because people psychologically have been wounded over the years and carried yeah. that wound with them. And we yeah. start that, it seems like a relatively innocuous kind of workshop uh, lesson, but inevitably people will leave or, or call me later and say, I had to leave the room because I was in tears. I had to process mm -hmm. this. But then we turn it around and say, okay, that was you. Now think about the people that you work with or that you lead how, what is, what's their feedback story? And if they don't know, we say, there's your ex, there's your work. <laughs> Ask them how they want to receive feedback. Ask them how they want to interact with you. And they seem so simple, but it really gets us started in that. And then now you can start to build the culture kind of one conversation at a time. So we're going to shift to Mark's provocative statement. If we have time, we'll circle back to our second provocative statement about feedback. All right. Because this hour is slowly disappearing from us. It so is. Mark, fabulous. Share, share your provocative statement with us. I actually I think that we're already answering the the statement in the conversation we've been having um, with these two other books, but um, I would tell you that from my perspective, we are right now um, at the most rapid and significant change in human history and how we interact. And in fact some of the um, work as I was researching my book that there are actually some scientists who are kind of declaring that we're moving into it or have moved into a new geologic epic called the Anthropocene, which is the time of humans that we've actually altered oh, I got the chills. planet that we live mm -hmm. on enough that it's changing our geology. Certainly, um, it's stunning to look at the changes through machine learning are so quick right now that we don't even necessarily notice how fast they're coming at us. I love when I speak, sometimes I'll just pull a um, my phone out of my pocket like Steve Jobs did and see, say, you know, that was only in 2007. That was only 12 years ago. And look at our lives. So, so the thing is right now, because of that, we need a different blueprint of how we lead. And when I talk about leading, 
I'm not talking about being a boss. I'm talking about uh, we can be a leader in the neighborhood in which we live, in our community groups, in our schools, in our organizations, but we need to show up differently. And you all are already addressing the things that I, you know, I laid out when I went and researched the book, um, Outward Bound Lessons to Live a Life of Leadership. I, it comes from, from leading wilderness-based trips. And if you don't know about Outward Bound, um, let's say Kelly just put up the Outward Bound address and people can go look at it, but it's, it's a, the, the birthplace of experiential education and wilderness-based learning came from Outward Bound. It was born during World War II. It's all over the world. Uh, millions of people have taken it. And I would, um, I would posit that um, Kurt Hahn, who founded Outward Bound, has, has had a larger positive impact in the world than any single human being, but nobody knows who he is. And, mm -hmm. and the basis for a lot of the learning that I um, have done in the world came from what I learned as an Outward Bound instructor. And so I interviewed a bunch of people, some of them famous people like Arthur Blank, who founded the Home Depot, or Mark Udall, a former U.S. Senator. And I asked them to tell their stories. And from that, we really laid out, how do you respond to these changes? And it really is all the things we've been talking about for the last hour all show up in the lessons that they learned. And it's, um, mm. it's amazing to me how much we've aligned because it really is critically important right now. If we don't master, if we don't master how to lead human beings, then we are going to be in a we're going to be in a um, a world of hurt. So we're gonna we're gonna run the poll here of the thing that you think is the most important characteristic for a leader, and we'll just get a people's opinion. Sorry about that, Mark. I, I was right. waiting, and then I launched it too fast. I didn't give you a, I didn't give you the space in there, but um. But it's amazing to me in meeting these other authors and talking here how much we are aligned. And I really feel like, you know, right now more than ever, we need this alignment because our, 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 our outmoded ways of leading are, um, in some ways, they are the things that have brought us to this point, but they're also the things that could destroy us right now. And it's time, it's time for us to really um, embrace a completely different way of operating and connecting with each other. And so... You know, I'm, I'm super excited to be a part of this conversation and talk about these skills because they're really, really important. And I really am frustrated that we can't vote. <laughs> so we'll have to register a complaint with Zoom that panelists want to be able to use the poll functionality. <laughs> what would you be voting for here, Susan? I would be voting for compassion. I mean, I think all three are really important, but I know that um, there's been some really extraordinary work around motivation and compassion and empathy, and that uh, that's the heart of human connection. So that's that, that's where I'd go. So Laura and Tamara, uh, where would you where would you land on voting for this poll? I was right there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. But I think those other two are are vital, super important as well. But yeah, I think that it's back to the idea of putting the human back in this whole process. Now watch, gonna, we'll all be wrong. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and share the results. It looks like compassion was the clear winner uh, on this poll with 47% of you thinking compassion is the most important characteristic of a leader today. Um, and we do have a question in the chat based on uh, the points you're all bringing out. What's your opinion of the movement around unbossed, if you're aware of it? I'm not sure I am. I think that there's also, I know um, there's a company called Atlassian that's, you know, kind of done this um, unstructured workplace, if you will, where, where people come and to connect on projects they're interested in and, and drive toward results. So I, I would just say to that question, um, and I'm not sure if this is exactly addressing on boss that I, like, I think there maybe there's, maybe there, there's a, a method of getting there that's critically important. So, so mm -hmm. as, a, as a result of an outward bound experience, uh, as a leader at, uh, when I was an outward bound, my, my goal would be to create a, a group that could um, first in an emotionally and physically safe way take care of each other and to master all the skills they need to do whatever we're doing in the winter so that they could function completely without me, that they mm -hmm. could care for each other. They could, they could do the skills. So when you think about being out in the wilderness, there's these skills of, you know, I'm canoeing, I'm setting up a tent, I'm cooking. And those are the things people usually grab onto. And then usually, people usually think of the high risk stuff. Oh, I'm afraid of heights. Climbing is scary. But the most difficult thing usually for people is actually sitting down together around the fire when they have to be 
interpersonally connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as a leader, you're right in there with them. So I would say, you know, to me, my goal always as a leader has been to have a group that can function without me. If I've done that well, I really have been an effective leader. And that's a little different um, that, um, than most leadership models where you're trying to hold on to that power all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally think it's a great thing for a, any leader to strive toward empowering people enough that they don't. Yeah, I, at People Firm, we've been doing a lot of work um, that really falls more under our org design, our structure um, uh, line of services that starts to think about how do we sort of break the old models and create far more agile, flat, um, empowered models um, within organizations. And I think that's ultimately where we're going. I think it's going to take us a while to get there. Um, and it's, it is because of the old ideas and the old ways we think about how we lead and manage. And, but there is some really amazing research that does look at unstructured teams will outperform, um, you know, hierarchical teams, but that requires having a clear strategy, having clear roles and accountability. Right. Yeah. Um, and really leaning into an idea where you start to recognize people for the capabilities and the contributions that they're bringing to the table and less about where they sit organizationally. And that's shifting for a lot of us away from our traditional thinking about titles and levels and roles and all of that. So um, we call it the manager dilemma. There's, mm. We have way too many managers that aren't really suited for management in positions that they don't even really love themselves. Mm. Um, but to, you know, we, we have this analogy of sort of like breaking into a lobster. We have to like crack that hard shell and really start to pull it all apart before we can ah. rethink what that's going to look like for more, most enterprises. And that's, that takes a lot of courage. That's some big work. You know, Mark, in, um, in 2005, um, I wrote a book with Ken Blanchard called Self-Leadership and the One Minute Manager. It was based on a program where we were, we were actually teaching individuals how to solicit and receive feedback um, that, from the early 90s. And when we put that book out, there was almost no research except for a guy named Charles Manns on this whole notion of self-leadership and what was really required. And then we just re-released that book in 2017. And between in that in intervening 12 years, there's just a plethora of research. And, and this, here's the statement that the most essential ingredient for the success of any organizational initiative is the proactive behavior of individual contributors. And so I think your comment about yeah, it's a great thing, but we have to understand what it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a matter of being unstructured. It's a matter of making sure that people go through the development levels necessary yeah. right. to, so they can take Absolutely. the lead. Right. Absolutely. And that, I, I call that expeditionary leadership. That's the language I use. So you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're going on a journey, if you yeah. will, from the point where you are to an end oh, I love point. That. And I think so often in organizations, we focus on the performance goals of the company, right? That's, and that not, and I don't for a minute say, that I'm not saying that those things aren't important. Those are the lifeblood of a company, right? We, you know, you need to earn revenue to survive, you know, but, but a, 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 a triathlon, triathlon or a um, marathon runner doesn't train to have more blood, you know, like the blood is what allows them to function. <laughs> and, and that high, that higher purpose stuff, I think when you, when you can, when you can get leaders to, to, to walk into your world, Susan, imagine if a leader focused on, I'm going to lay out a path of, of mastery for people so they can be growing and learning. I am going to be really attentive and connected to them. So they know that I love and care about them. Um, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to, align a really powerful sense of purpose out there in the world so that I'm going to attract the people who share that sense of purpose. That's a winning formula to make a really powerful organization. But, yeah. but you got to teach from the beginning, right? When someone comes in, they don't know how, they don't know how to do that stuff. They've yes, been in yes, traditional yes, businesses. They don't, they don't know how to work that way. Absolutely. You know, Mark, your, your book is so beautiful because of that, that element. It comes through so clearly that, that whole idea that profit is a byproduct of doing these other things well. And that the more you focus on results, the less likely you are to get those results. And that's what the science shows. So doing the things that you're talking about in your book 
ends up getting people those results. But for some reason, we're like we've been talking about all, all hour, we're so embedded with we got to focus on results. We got to drive results. We've got to, you know, just uh, keep the eye on the scoreboard instead of on the game. That hmm. it's hard to get people off those old habits. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, as we come to the end of the hour, I thought it might be nice to offer you the chance to kind of summarize your provocative statement one more time for those who have been listening. Um, Kelly is putting in the chat a link to each of the books uh, that we highlighted today and also a link to each of your websites. So if you're on today's event and you want to learn more uh, from any of these authors, we would welcome you to check out their books and buy their books today and then also to find them on their website. So all of that will be in the chat as well as in our follow-up email. Um, I'm going to start with Mark, Mark, if you want to summarize uh, the perspective you're bringing to the call, we'll go backwards today. Oh, I'm sorry, but can Mark, he never told us what the true statement was on the poll. Well, ah. I, I would tell you um, from, from my research and understanding, it's a simple and the values of that we're bound, we say above all compassion. So mm -hmm. now that the others are not critically important, but if we, if we don't come forward with a compassionate heart, I think, you know, a sense of purpose without compassion is, you know, uh, it's very hollow. Mm. So yeah. to to summarize to summarize, I guess my perspective here is that we're we're at, at we're at a period of the most um, rapid and intense change that we've ever experienced in life, and often that change causes a lot of disequilibrium for people. There are people who are feeling left behind and disconnected, and and that we need we need a leadership model that really allows us to um, allows us to make those connections. That really human centered um, leadership from here forward and that those lessons exist out there. And again, what we're, what we're seeing today in these three books, the, the synergy be, between the three of them, it, I think just supports that philosophy that it's really, we're at, we're at the most amazing time in human history right now if we can harness human potential and if we can learn this new way of operating. So um, the, the book Outward Bound Lessons to Live a Life of Leadership simply offers some of those lessons and, and Honestly, I think they align with everything that um, my, my co-speakers uh, today are talking about. So buy their books. You'll find great tools to put out there in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Tamara and Laura, I'm not sure who's going to summarize for, for you or if you're both going to talk. It's your turn next. We're, we're good at co-talking. Um, <laughs> I would just, you know, I would just say that... Um, you know, as we said, feedback is broken. It has a branding problem. And Laura and I are on a mission to create a whole movement to fix feedback. And the number one way that we all, everyone on this call can lean in to do that is to become a seeker. And so we hope that, you know, per Laura's question, you take that opportunity to go out and seek some good stuff this week, find out where you're having impact. Laura? I think the one thing that we didn't get to talk about it is the, the neuroscience and the research, and it's in the title, Why Do We Fear It? So if anything we were talking about today sounds exciting, but still you're having a bit of a fear-based reaction, you know, neuroscience has come so far, and we know that the brain reacts to feedback much like an injury or an assault. And if we can start to neurologically shift and shift our biology, we can change those bad old habits. So, so do give the book a read because the, the neuroscience behind it uh, will also help you, you know, cultivate that self-compassion and compassion for others. Thanks, Laura. Susan? Wow. Well, um... We really have been living in the dark ages of motivation. And I think everybody's attesting to the need for radical change. And I believe that the science that Master Your Motivation is based on is the greatest breakthrough in the history of motivation science. And that is this idea that people want to thrive. No one wants to be lazy. No one enjoys being bored. Um, we all want to grow and learn and make contributions. And that's our nature. Our nature is to want to have choice in our life. Um, and so if we can just accept our basic human nature and even start to watch babies and how they're constantly choosing to grab the spoon to feed themselves 
or reaching out and needing to see you, look you in the eyes and they turn your face if you're not looking at them because they need connection or watching a baby learn to walk and even when they fall, they get up just full of joy and, 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 and being thrilled that they're, they're learning something. And so every day, if we could just learn to ask ourselves, but if you're a leader, just imagine the power. If you ask people every day, tell me about the choices you made and how you felt about them and what choices do you have going forward? What did you do today that was aligned with your values, brought meaning, or did you think made a contribution to the greater good? And tell me what you learned today. How did you grow? If we could just get connected to having motivation conversations with people, I think we could make the world a better place. Thanks so much. Thanks to all of you who have joined us both today and throughout the year for our webinars here at Weaving Influence. And we look forward to lots of great events coming in 2020. Our follow-up email will uh, give you a glimpse into the very first event of next year, which is with Bev K and Julie Winkle Giulioni. And uh, so you'll not want to miss signing up for that first event, which is January 14th, 2020, I think, if I got the date right. All That's of that- all of that along with uh, resources from today's authors will be in the follow-up email and I do encourage you to get these books today. Have a Thanks great for hosting. Holiday Thank you all. Bye everyone.